All right, grade 12 chemistry. We're talking about buffers today. Uh, we're going to start with uh, a little bit of a, um, a mathematical problem about figuring out the pH of salt solutions. So calculating the pH of a salt solution. But then we're going to do an intro to buffers and what buffers are. We'll do optimal pH for buffers. Uh, we'll talk about the bicarbonate buffer, which is the buffer that's present in your body. Uh, and then we'll talk briefly about buffering capacity. Um, so uh, let's get started with this one. I'm going to revisit the salts and pH lesson because um, I feel like that might have been a bit confusing in the previous video. Um, here is sodium. Sodium is the conjugate acid of sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is a very strong base, so sodium is going to be a very weak acid. Right? Uh, we can see that down here. The sodium, if we add it to water, it might make sodium hydroxide, the aqueous form of it, and release some H+. So in this case, uh, the sodium is actually acting as an acid because it's releasing H+, in the water. But NaOH is a very, very strong base. So it's a strong base. And strong base means it's, it prefers to dissociate, right? It prefers to dissociate. Um, so adding Na isn't really going to do much. Therefore, we ignore if we ignore the sodium. Ignore ignore this reaction. Right, uh, we know that this is going to go really far that way. Uh, but the acetate, the acetate, um, it's a conjugate base of a weak acid. This acetic acid stuff, um, and so uh, it will. Um, this this is a weak acid, so it's got a weak dissociation constant. So most of it is going to be in this form when it's in water. So adding this to water will actually push that way because this acid likes to be in in this uh, undissociated form. That's what this this value is telling us. This Ka value. Um, yeah. um, so uh, we can use this to predict the pHs of solutions. So let's, let's put 0.5 molar of this in water. Um, we are going to ignore, right? We're going to ignore the contribution of the sodium because the sodium is a very terrible. It's a terrible acid because it's conjugate to a very very good base. We're only going to focus on the acetate ion. Um, uh, one reminder here is that the H plus and the OH minus is 10 to the minus 14, uh, and this leads us to this react this equation that the Ka of this acid is times the Kb of the conjugate base is always equal to 10 to the minus 14. We can prove that with math. I'll show you guys that in class, uh, or you can just look it up, or I'll probably find a video or something down below um, to, to derive that. But that means that if this acid has a Ka of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, we can find out the Kb of the acetate, because this is the conjugate base. That's the conjugate base of this acid. So let's, uh, let's do that. Let's start with that. Let's find the Kb of um, acetate of CH3COO minus. Um, so we know that then that the Ka um, of its conjugate acid uh, or its, its acid uh, is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. Um, so the, this Kb times 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5 is 10 to the negative 14. Uh, you know, uh, simple algebra, we divide the 10 to the minus 14. We divide both sides by 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. 5 divide by 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. Um, and we'll get um, this Kb value. So let's actually do that in our calculator. 10. 10 to the power of negative 14 divided by 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. I'll show you how I put that in my calculator, right? It's 1.10 times 10 to the negative 14 divided by 1. Actually, it wouldn't be 10 to the negative 14. It will be 1 to the 10 to the negative 14. So let's delete that. So 1 times 10, 1 times 10 to the negative 14 divided by 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5. I get 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. So we'll write that down. Kb is uh, 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. That's the base dissociation constant of 
this acetic acid. And that's exactly what we need because here's the equation, right? This plus water making uh, CH3COOH plus OH minus that is the constant for that equation. And that's the equation we're interested in. AQ, 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 and liquid. Um, if we write out this equation, uh, this one's liquid, so we don't care about it, but these these do count. Um, we can do an ice table, I, C, E, um, oh, so I, C, E should go down the side, I, C, E, uh, and I'm going to do a little shorthand here. This guy is going to be A, C minus, uh, this guy is going to be uh, H, A, C, and this is going to be OH minus. So the AC minus is going to start at 0.5 molar because that's what we're that's what we said in our question, right? 0.5 molar sodium acetate, which is 0.5 molars of sodium, 0.5 molars of acetate, 0.5 molar. The uh, HAC that starts at zero, and the OH minus starts at well, 10 to the negative seven, right? It's gonna be a, a very small uh, number because neutral water, that's the concentration of OH minus. Right. Uh, this is clearly going to push this way. Right, it's gonna push this way. So this is going to lose X. This is going to gain X. And this is going to gain X as well because it's a one to one to one ratio. So it's gonna be 0.5 minus X. Um, this is going to be x, and this is going to be 10 to the negative 7 plus x. Okay. Um, so we can put that into our calculation now, right? k is going to be these two multiplied together, which is going to be x, right? x times 10 to the negative 7 plus x over 0 0.5 minus x. Um, and k is equal to this value here, 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10, which tells us that x is probably going to be very small. Um, sorry, it tells us that x is probably going to be pretty big, actually, because uh, a lot of it is going to go over to the, um, uh, the acetate. Uh, what's going on? Sorry, that's a very small one, so it's going to favor the reactants. So yes, X is going to be um, quite small in this case. Uh, no, uh, so if X is going to be uh, quite small, uh, then we can kind of ignore it down here. We can make our simplifying assumption. I don't think X is going to be anywhere close to 0 0.5. Uh, so then we get k is equal to um, x squared minus 10 to the negative 7x over x, well, negative x. Um, or over 0 0.5. Um, now, if x is going to be very small, then 10 to the negative 7 times x is going to be very small as well. So we can just kind of ignore that, too. Um, and so we get x squared over 0 0.5. Uh, so then our, um, our equation is going to be um, 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. equals x squared over 0 0.5. The 0 0.5 is going to come up, um, so we're multiplying by 0 0.5. We're going to cut that in half. So let's do that. Let's, let's cut that in half. We're multiplying by 0 0.5 on both sides, 5.6. Um, let's actually break that out. So 0 0.5 times, you know, times 0 0.5, because we're doing our algebra. Uh, and I'm going to finish that off up here. What we get then is x squared is equal to half of 5.6, uh, which is, what, 2.8? Yeah, 2.8 times 10 to the negative 10. 
x is equal to the square root of 2.8 times 10 to the negative 10. So I'll show you that in my calculator, square root of 2.8 times 10 to the negative 10. That's how I put it in my calculator, root 2.8 times 10 to the negative 10. I get 0 0.00016, 0 0.00016. Uh, so 0 0.00016. Well, 17, we'll say. Yeah, 17. Or it's 1.7 times 10 to the negative 5. Right, which is pretty close to um, to the acid, um, and uh, that is the concentration of OH minus pretty much. X is pretty much the concentration of OH minus. So the concentration of OH minus then is about 1.7 times 10 to the negative five. And we're adding plus 10 to the negative seven to it. But that's just gonna you know that's that's gonna be 1.71 basically, times the negative five kind of thing. It's not really gonna affect it, it's less than a percent. Um, so then the POH, POH is going to be a negative log of that number, 1.7 times 10 to the negative five. So let's take that, negative log of 1.7, negative log 1.7 times 10 to the negative five. Here's how that looks in my calculator, All right? New negative log 1.7 times 10 to the negative 5, 4.77, right, 4.77, that's the pOH, pOH, that's the, the OH uh, one, pH is going to be this, pOH plus pH equals 14. POH plus pH equals 14. Um, so uh, 14 minus the POH, 14 minus 4.77 gives us the pH. pH is going to be 9.23. So all that work to get the pH being 9.23. Um, yeah, um, but the important thing again, we're able to make that simplifying assumption that this is quite small and that that's going to be very uh, uh, pretty, pretty much uh, arbitrarily small. You know, it comes out to x squared, basically. Uh, so yeah, that's um, that's the idea uh, for for this one. We're going to move on to the next section. Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to pause here. Yeah. So uh, for buffer solutions, we're now going to talk about the intro to buffers. We're gonna take what we just learned. We just learned that um, adding sodium acetate to a solution will decrease the pH. It'll it'll make it more basic. As increase the pH, it'll make it more basic. Um, and we're going to use that uh, to talk about buffers. So here's acetic acid and sodium acetate, or just acetate, um, and they go back and forth in this equilibrium. Uh, and what a buffer does essentially. The, the very main kind of explanation of a buffer is, is something that resists changes in pH. Uh, and one thing to realize is that changes in pH, changes in pH, literally just mean changes in hydrogen, hydrogen ion concentration. So as long as you've got hydrogen ion concentration or hydroxide ion concentration, because that's tied to the hydrogen ion concentration in your equilibrium system, it's going to resist changes in pH. It's the Chasselier's principle. If the pH tries to go up, which means the hydrogen concentration is going down, the buffer will shift to increase the hydrogen concentration. If the hydrogen tries to go um, up, which means the pH will go down, um, it'll shift the other way. So let's let's run that through. Um, let's run that through the uh, Chasselier's principle. If I add H plus, my H plus my concentration of H plus is going to go up. That's going to make more H plus, which can collide with the, the acetate, and the equilibrium is gonna drive this way, right? It's gonna drive that way. So that'll reduce the amount of H plus. It'll also reduce the amount of uh, CHO. So the, the effect is going to be reduced acetate. Um, so it's going to push back. 
it can never push back all the way, but it'll push back some. Um, so it'll, it'll resist that change in pH, something that wouldn't happen if it was just pure water. If I add OH, I'm increasing the amount of OH. I'm increasing the amount of OH. And that increases the chance of this reaction happening, so that's gonna push this way. The effect there is a decrease in hydrogen. So adding hydroxide decreases the amount of hydrogen ion. Decreasing the amount of hydrogen ion means that this reaction is less favorable, right? The, the reverse reaction is less favorable. So this is going to shift forwards to compensate for the decrease in hydrogen. We'll get more acetate and less acetic acid. So we see in this way that this one equilibrium can compensate for an increase in H plus or a decrease in H plus, an increase in OH minus or a decrease in OH minus. It's a buffer. It stabilizes the pH. Pure water can't do this nearly as effectively because this is a, a very small equilibrium. There's not a lot of this stuff. So yeah, an equilibrium, as long as there's a way, as long as it's linked to H plus and OH minus in some way, you'll get a little bit of buffering capacity. It's particularly good if you have weak acids and weak bases because then you have some of this stuff and some of this stuff in the water. Um, next up is the effectiveness of buffers. Uh, effectiveness of buffers. Uh, these, um, these charts show, uh, you know, this is the acetic acid, this is the acetate, and you see that uh, as the pH increases, it gets more basic, you get more of the conjugate base. As uh, the pH decreases, it gets more acidic, you get more of the acid. This is because there's more hydrogen around, so it's more likely to be attaching itself onto the acetic acid. If there's less hydrogen around, it's more likely to be ripped off of the, the acetate and out in the water. And they cross over. There's a 50-50 point where there's half of one and half of the other. Um, and that happens right here at about 4.76. Uh, and that happens to be the pKa of acetic acid. That's the crossover point. And that's where the buffer is going to be the most effective because you have half on one side and half on the other. So it, it can counteract to those changes in pH most effectively. You have kind of the most of reserve one way or the other way to buffer. Um, and this is different for every buffer system. This is the one for acetic acid. This, this one, I'm gonna take away my face for a second. This is the one for bicarbonate. You can see the bicarbonate HCO3. And you see the crossover point happens around seven point something. Um, so it becomes effective there. Um, the crossover for the acid is 6.1 for carbonic acid, which is the carbon dioxide. So, um, yeah, that's that's that. Uh, if you add more of the base, uh, it'll push it higher, as we saw uh, in our calculation earlier, where we added acetate that pushed it to a higher pH. It was like nine point something, um, and it improves the buffering capacity. There's an equation for this: it's the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, uh, and it uses the pKa of that acid. And this is the concentration of the conjugate base over the concentration of the acid itself. And that gives you the pH. So that, that actually gives you this curve here. That's, that's where you'll be on this curve, the pH of the buffer solution. Um, and that's where you get the buffering region. So uh, if this is where you have enough, you know, base, conjugate base and enough acid to kind of get into that equilibrium, eventually you use up all your base and then you can't stop, you can't fight the changes in pH anymore and it goes up. Uh, where you use up all your acid and you can't stop the, the change in pH the other way. So so that's um, that's the buffer, that's, that's the usefulness of a buffer. Buffers are best closest to their pKa. Uh, if you wanna push it more basic, you just add more, um, more of the conjugate base. That's pretty cool. Uh, now let's talk about the bicarbonate buffer. This is the, the most common one in our blood, bicarbonate buffer, buffer. Um, uh, this is, uh, this has a, a pKa, the pKa of, of this is the carbonic acid pKa, 6.1. So it should be most effective at 6.1 if we just let it do its thing. But there's a lot of bicarbonate in our body. Um, the bicarbonate is kept in the kidneys. There's a reserve in the kidneys of bicarbonate. So 
we dump a lot of bicarbonate into our blood. Uh, and in fact, most of the CO2 that's circulating in our blood is actually as bicarbonate rather than as dissolved CO2. Um, uh, blood needs to stay in the range of 7.35 to 7.45 in terms of a pH. If you think about pH, and it's like, you know, 7 is 10 to the negative 7 moles per liter, 0 0.000001 moles per liter. That's how tightly your your body can manage the hydrogen concentration. It's a very, very, very fine line. Um, and so it does that by having this bicarbonate buffer in there. If the if the acid, if the H plus goes up, um, it shifts to make more acid. If the H plus goes down, uh, it shifts to make more base. Um, and uh, you end up with, uh, with a counter shift with Le Chatelier's principles. So this is homeostasis, so it's adding and removing CO2. We talk a lot about this in the grade 12 biology class. Um, here's that Henderson-Hasselbalch equation again, where the actual pH is the pKa log 10 of the, the base over the acid. In this case, the bicarbonate in the kidneys pumps up the top part of this equation, so the pH goes higher um, than the actual pKa. It's 6.1 for the pKa. Uh, now this is also interesting because the H2CO3 comes from the CO2 from the air and from your, um, your metabolism dissolving into your blood. Uh, and that has its own equilibrium, water plus carbon dioxide making carbonic acid. So there's a second equilibrium to deal with there, which comes from this equilibrium. That's, that's that equilibrium's equilibrium constant. And that becomes the partial pressure of CO2. And so you get this kind of expression here of CO2, the gas partial pressure of CO2 in your blood, and the bicarbonate levels that your kidneys are throwing into your blood. And that controls the pH of your blood to that 7.4, that very, very narrow 7.4. Um, your lungs can breathe out or breathe in faster or slower to control the partial pressure of CO2. And your kidneys can release or absorb bicarbonate to keep it in balance. So the, the lung part is respiratory, the kidney part is me metabolic. Um, and uh, they'll actually do this in hospitals. They'll, you'll get blood tests of the bicarbonate levels, the CO2 levels, and the pH levels. And they, they help doctors figure out what might be wrong with you. So uh, this is called an ABG, which is, um, I think it's blood, blood gas analysis, something like that. Um, and uh, uh, they, they check the normal values. If the values are too high or too low, uh, they can figure out what the problem is. They can figure out if it's respiratory or metabolic. And you can kind of imagine that's important. Is it in the lungs that we need to look for the problem or is it in the metabolism that we need to look for the problem? Um, you know, different things will, will suggest different treatments. Um, and you can do that just by checking how much bicarbonate, how much CO2 is in the blood, uh, and things like that. It's, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, now, I don't know enough about the medical side of things besides the fact that they can use it to, to narrow down their options um, based on just this equilibrium that we know exists biochemically in the body, which is really cool. Uh, here's the last piece is buffering capacity. Um, we already kind of talked about it a little bit. Buffering capacity. Um, basically, uh, this is this is based on how much acid and how much conjugate base you have in your buffer. Right? Um, once you run out, if if say the buffer is, um, you know, here here's the buffer. Um, the optimal place is when you've got half acid, half base. Right, optimal optimal place is half acid, half base. Um, but as as the um, as you add base here, we're adding base and the pH is going up, the buffer is fighting back by creating, essentially creating H+, right? Because you're trying to take away the H+, it's creating H+, through the Chastity's principle, until it runs out of the, um, of the acid side of the equation, and then the base can very quickly overwhelm, and you get, um, you get an equivalence point, and you go, um, you know, it, it really goes, um, goes quickly. Um, and that's, that's where that pKa thing comes in. Uh, to increase this, you add more buffer. Uh, you add more of the salt. 
um, and you can play with the values using Henderson Hasselbach, this thing, to, to work out how much buffer um, to add. Um, this is important for stuff like, hey, aquariums, there's my aquarium back here. Um, I need to control the pH in my aquarium. It has to be right about seven. That's what my fish like. Uh, and so what I have, I have alkaline buffer, and I have acid buffer. And I can control how much of each one I put, because if we think about Henderson Hasselbach here, right, it's the base over the acid can control where the pH is going to be. Um, and so I can put more acid if I want it to be lower pH, more base if I want it to be higher pH. But I want a bit of both in order to have buffering capacity. I want to be able to have some wiggle room left and right. And they actually give you a handy dandy guide of here's how much pH you want and here's how much acid, oh, here's how much acid buffer versus alkaline buffer um, you should put in. You know, one to one, one to two, one to three. Um, and that's that's controlling this part of the Henderson Hasselbach equation. And to support the buffer even further, I have this stuff, which is literally called equilibrium. Um, and that contains all kinds of ions and stuff like that that will support the conjugate base and the acid as they do their job. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. That's yeah, it's a practical application of the Henderson Hasselbach equation. Um, of course, I'm not doing the Henderson Hasselbalk equation every time I want to figure out how much of this versus how much of this to add. I just use the chart. But, um, but you know, theoretically you could. We could work it out. Uh, so that's buffers. That's buffering capacity and buffering ability. They're very useful. Buffers are super useful. You'll find them in aquariums, swimming pools. You have them in your blood. Your cells have their own buffer system based on phosphate. Um, there's all kinds of, uh, of uses for buffer systems. Uh, very handy for maintaining a pH right where you want it. Um, and that's that's that. So reviewing, we calculated the pH of a salt solution, took a lot of math to do. Um, we did an intro to buffers, uh, talked about that optimal pH being near the pKa, and then the henderson Hasselbalch equation that you can push it left and right by adding more acid or adding more base to your buffer. Uh, we talked about the bicarbonate buffer in our body and how it works with the CO2 on one side and the, the kidneys with the HCO3 on the other side. Uh, and then we, we talked about buffering capacity, which is useful. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video, and I will see you guys in class for, uh, for discussions of buffers in the real world. All right.